So, without further ado, let me move on. And to start us off, we'll now hear about the Building Safety Act from a person who chaired the Independent Review of Building Regulations and Fire Safety following Grenfell. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dame Judith Hackett, a British engineer who has helped make such a positive impact on our industry. Dame Judith. Well, thank you for that introduction, Russell, and good morning, everyone. I'm truly delighted to be here and to have this opportunity to speak to you about the Building Safety Act, what it means for you, uh, and to, uh, I hope, encourage you, if you have not already started, to get on with it. So the title of my presentation this morning is, This Really Is Time to Rethink, to Reset, and to Recognise that from here on, the responsibility lies with all of you. That is the big change that comes about as a result of the Building Safety Act. My next slide is one that will be very familiar to you all. Why do I continue to show it? Very simply, because we must always remember why we are here today. We are here because we all failed. We all allowed this tragedy to happen. And we all felt the shock six years ago of seeing that tragic loss of life. And many people felt the guilt of knowing that it could have happened, maybe didn't speak up early enough. So I want to take you quickly through the timeline and my journey since I became involved immediately after Grenfell. Many of you will know this, but I think there's an interesting debate to be had about, on the one hand, some people say, why has it taken this long to get this far? And I read an article quite recently that said, we're going at this at breakneck pace, it's all happening too quickly. So that kind of feels like we must be doing it about right, because if people are saying it's too slow and too fast, we're probably in the right place. But just think about all that has happened in that time. The public inquiry began almost immediately in July 2017, and it's not there yet. We are still awaiting the final report. And let's all be very clear, that final report is not going to say, do nothing. So there will be more recommendations, I am sure, come out of that final report, but in the meantime, when I took up my role in August of the same year and started my independent review, we started a process that said, we have to do this with pace, we have to change things quickly, we cannot wait years for a public inquiry to tell us what is wrong if there are things that we can fix in a timely fashion. So I produced my report in May 2018, and then in July of that year, I was asked to chair the Industry Safety Steering Group and have been doing that now for five years. We meet every two months. There may even be some of you in the audience today who've had the experience of being grilled by the Industry Safety Steering Group. Uh, but we have, I think, contributed quite a lot to keeping that pace and that pressure on industry to make change, and I'll say more about that later in my presentation. By late 2019, we had the new building safety regulator stood up, and it was clear that it was going to be part of the health and safety executive, as I had recommended. It also became clear that we were going to have a new construction products regulator. And by April of 2022, the Act was passed and received royal assent. Now some of the milestones are starting to bite and be felt across the whole of the built environment sector. As of the 1st of October, 
All existing high-rise buildings have to be registered. And after an exceedingly slow start to the process in April, I was very pleased to see that more than 14,000 buildings did, in fact, get registered by the deadline of the 1st of October. The Act in its entirety takes full effect from April next year. So it really is starting to feel real for everyone. And I want to make a statement of tribute today to the work of the officials in government and those in the building safety regulator for the huge amount of effort that they have put into getting us to where we are today. I know there will be those of you in the audience who will say, but we still don't know this, we still don't know that, we still don't have this secondary legislation. But think about all that you do have, all of the information, all of the guidance to get you going on that journey of culture change and different behaviour. And all of that, I think, is even more remarkable when you consider whatever else has been going on in the world while we've been doing this. We've had Brexit. That has an impact on the supply chains in this industry like everyone else. We've had COVID. We now know we have to respond even more quickly to climate change. We've got concerns about health risks in buildings. We live in a very politically uncertain world. We're dealing with inflation. Rack was mentioned even before I took the stage. It's a long list. And what it tells you is the world's not standing still. We have to get on and do this thing on building safety, but we have to do all of these other things as well. So building safety really is now about quality and about resilience and I think it's entirely compatible with sustainability, which is the agenda you're going to come on to talk about later. It requires champions in the industry to take this forward. We need leaders to stand up and say, we can do this. And we need to recognize that we're nowhere near the destination yet. This is a long journey. There is more to come. And it's not a one-off change. We're not going to turn a switch on the 1st of April next year, and it's all going to be fine. We're going to be learning as we go for some years to come. So, on building safety, what did my review say? You know all of this, because you've heard it before. But again, I'd ask you to look at this slide with a different lens today. The first point on this slide says the building regulatory system was weak and it failed. Therefore, we need a new regulatory system. What it then goes on to tell you is a whole catalogue of behaviours and activities that were taking place within the industry because it was possible to get away with doing all of those things because of the weak legislation. But make no mistake where the proportion of the change needs to come from. The regulatory framework is now in place. The regulators are in place. It is now down to industry to deliver on all of those things that I've listed there. Design and change management has to be done professionally. It has to be done properly. We need to ensure that the right people are engaged at the right time, that people are competent to do what they need to do. We have much more work to do on product testing and assurance. And people need to open up, they need to share information, and they need not to sit on knowledge, particularly when it's on areas of concern and things that are worrying them. So I identified all of those things that need to change, and now we have the new regime, which is underpinned by a set of very important key principles. The new approach is systems-based. For an industry that is so fragmented, 
and tries to keep silos in place wherever possible. I was interested in the comments about collaboration in the intro. Not something I see that much of, if I'm honest, in this industry. If people are driving it, that's great, but we need to see much, much more openness, sharing, and collaboration. And this systems-based approach will drive that. And with that comes a requirement for people to be competent, to recognize that they are accountable, and to take responsibility for the delivery of the right outcomes. This is a culture change. I've said that repeatedly. But it's a culture change that does both providing incentives for those who want to do the right thing and to be recognized for doing that, but also increases significantly the level of sanction and disincentive for those who continue to try to game the system. It is also risk-based and proportionate. I've heard lots of people say, this is all about high-rise buildings. No, it's not. It's about all buildings. Let's be very clear about that. But what you see in this new framework is a risk-based approach which ramps up. And for those buildings of highest risk, where we use height as a proxy for measuring that risk, because of multiple occupancy and the potential for multiple fatalities in the event of a collapse or a fire, those are the buildings where that regime will be the toughest and the most searching. But what we're out to do is to set up a regulator that is focused on making sure we get the right outcomes, not on telling you how to do it. That responsibility lies with all of you in industry. In part, that is so that you can continue to innovate. But in innovating, you take with that the burden of risk and demonstration of proof that your innovations are safe and fit for purpose. It's all about focusing on delivering quality buildings that are safe and fit to live in. And remembering, of course, in all of this, the all-important people in this process, the residents, with whom we all have a job to do to rebuild trust and confidence. So I said that the, the, the outset, at the outset that this is about rethinking and resetting the way you do things. I could also say this is about doing what you always should have been doing. But the regulatory change is going to drive that, but it will only provide the framework. We now need to ensure that that change in responsibility takes hold. And increasingly, I'm starting to get the sense that people recognize this. There are some still who are continuing to say, I need more information, I need the secondary legislation. But that's getting less, and that's good. Because this is no longer about compliance and ensuring you can tick the boxes with the rules. This is about breaking out the silos, as I've said, more collaboration. Not simply assuming others have done their bit, but assuring yourselves that they have. And that you've thought about what could go wrong and taken steps to mitigate it. As I said, I see a strong sense that the proximity of the full force of the act is starting to make people rethink. And I'm seeing more people recognize that need to change. And even more encouragingly, people who are saying, we have to make this work. Because that's so important that we all recognize that we have a part to play in making this new system work. It isn't just down to the regulator to make it happen. Every one of us has something to do. As I've said, I think there are links and compatibilities with the other agendas, whether that be quality, sustainability, resilience, 
All of those things take us down that path of doing better and ensuring that we meet multiple outcomes and purposes all at the same time. It is not about one or the other. We have to do them all. That is a fundamental culture shift, of course. The regulators will help to hold that in place. But also, some of this will be underpinned by greater activity from third-party accreditors and also by increased professional competence. As I said, multiple occupancy buildings particularly are some of the most complex that we have to deal with and have to think about. But we also have to recognise that this new approach it recognises that life cycle of the building and goes beyond simply completing the project and handing it over to someone else, often with very little information for them to go on in terms of what they have. That all has to change and that responsibility will be clear throughout design, construction, and the life cycle of the asset in use to preserve its integrity. So we all have to think in those multiple dimensions. I'm not sure how many of you have seen this next slide before, but I've decided to start using it in my presentations because it's one that... I've been familiar with for many, many years in the chemical industry that I was part of for so long. It's a model called the Swiss cheese model uh, from a man named Reason. And it's all about recognising the importance of multiple layers of protection. So anyone who thinks, well, my bit in the building process is only a small bit, So it doesn't really apply to me, it doesn't matter. Wrong. Every single one of those layers matter. Because none of them will ever be perfect. But the more layers of protection and assurance that you have, the greater the assurance for the building as a whole. Because the failure only happens when all of those weaknesses in all of those systems line up. So preserving the integrity of every single one of those layers is hugely important. So those of you in the audience who are specifiers, if you're only specifying one small part of this process, your role is key to ensuring that we get the right materials, the right design, in the right place, put in by people who know how to do it and do it properly. So where are we today? Well, as I said earlier, I've been chairing the Industry Safety Steering Group for five years. And what we've seen over that five-year period is a lot of progress being made. Slow to start with, but the pace is increasing. There is industry leadership emerging, but what's been really interesting to us on the ISSG has been the extent to which In the last six months or so, particularly, we've had much, much more engagement with the financial community and the insurance industry. Why is that important? Well, because, as I said earlier, there are multiple stakeholders in this process, not just the regulator. And if the financial community are going to want to know that you are a responsible actor in this new scheme, that provides even further incentive for you to do the right thing. If the insurance industry is going to demand proof that you understand your role and your responsibilities, that also is going to provide an incentive to do the right thing. So those market forces are going to underscore, for me, the requirements of the regulation. We must also, of course, work on all of the things to do with competence. And we must recognise, as we go forward from here, that dealing with new build and dealing with existing buildings are going to provide challenges, but that they will be different. And I'll say more about that in a moment. But let's first just 
reiterate some of those key features. Because you've heard already this morning that this is about a safety case regime for those buildings of highest risk. What does a safety case regime do? It makes people think about what could go wrong, how to manage the consequences, but more importantly, how to do it right in the first place so that you mitigate those risks and, if possible, eliminate them by good design and by building what you said you were going to build. And the gateways in this new system are going to be hugely important. We've already had experience now for some time of Gateway 1 where the regulator has looked at initial plans and in the initial phase they were rejecting over half of them but we've moved on from that. That same process I'm sure is going to happen at the next Gateway which is the detailed design process and ultimately at the commissioning stage where without that permission from the regulator, the building will not be able to be occupied. So really important key points in the decision-making process for those buildings that we will need to think about and recognise that the role now falls to those who are doing the design, doing the building, to demonstrate that they've done what they said they were going to do. And that, in turn, means that the whole supply chain needs to respond differently, needs to provide more data, both on the products and the materials, but also the competence of the people. That's going to mean more data sharing and collaboration. I would suggest it was going to, it's going to lead to greater standardization of processes, I would also suggest that we are going to see much more upfront design of buildings. And what is currently described as design and build, which means design it as you go, is going to get less and less because that will not pass muster for the new regulator. So there are many aspects of culture change that I think we are going to see and that's why I describe it as a journey. On new build, we have an opportunity to make a change at this point and take it forward. That's going to require absolutely a digital approach. That's a great opportunity and one that I hope you are all ready and willing to undertake. But it's also about reverting to what value engineering should always have been about, which is providing quality and value, not simply about cost reduction. And it's also truly, for new build, a once-in-a-generation opportunity to leave that race to the bottom behind and commit to doing things right in the first place, as you should have been doing. Existing stock, of course, is going to be more difficult because this is about buildings that we already have, many of whom we don't know as much about as we would like to. So there is undoubtedly going to be a requirement with some of those, I'm sure, to make improvements. But what I'm also confident of is that the regulator will do that in a proportionate way. So it may be that what's required in existing buildings will not be the same standards that will be expected for new build. From an industry perspective, the key is to start collecting whatever information you can, doing that due diligence around what you can find, burying your head in the sand and saying, I can't do this, it's not going to work. You really do have to do your best, but equally recognise that people are going to be fairly pragmatic about knowing the flaws in the systems of the past. And we're really going to start to see how that works out. And that's another aspect where we're going to learn as we go once that starts in April. But as I bring this presentation to a close, I just want to say again that this is about all buildings, not just about high-rise. Yes, that's where I focused my attention 
because they're the ones of greatest risk, where the greatest loss of life can happen in the event of failure. But the principles apply to every building. And my message to you is very simple. This change is coming. It's unstoppable. The regulators are stood up. The act is in place. It is going to happen. You need to be ready and you need to be motoring to make it happen, but also to recognise that simply meeting the requirements of this act is the start, because there will be more to follow, whether that is more regulation on products, whether it's more recommendations from the public inquiry, whether it's new risks that emerge. And we already know some of those, whether that be aerated concrete, I'd argue that's not a new risk, it's one we've just remembered. But things like electric vehicles that we park underground in high-rise buildings. Have we really addressed the risk of that yet? I think not. So there are other things coming and we need to take account of it. So in closing, time to rethink. Reset, get on with it. Recognise that change of mindset. Commit to being part of the solution. Commit to being part of making it work. It's easy to take a pop at the regulator because they're not quite ready yet. We haven't got this piece of guidance yet. But look at some of the other guidance that other people are producing and which the regulator is more than ready to endorse. There's lots of help out there, lots of ways in which you can start to make progress and get ready for this. And mostly, most importantly of all, Remember why you're doing it. We're not doing this because we've got new regulation and we've got a new regulator. We've, we're doing it because we failed. And we have to put this right for now and for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dane Judith. Uh, it's really insightful, and I think we're just going to spend uh, uh, 10 minutes or so uh, with a couple of questions for Dame Judith uh, on the stage, if yep. we can. Um, we were not originally going to open this up to people in the audience because we've got some questions that have already come in. But I'm feeling like it would be a good opportunity to open it up. So we don't have a Roman mic, uh, but I will open it up for questions. So raise your hand um, once I've just asked my few questions here, and then we'll open it to the floor. OK, um, so really interesting presentation. And, and clearly, as you say, a, a lot of this is around cultural yeah. uh, change. The, the one question I had, and it comes from some of the discussions we had last night in a, in a slightly different forum, but uh, with a room full of uh, specifiers and manufacturers, let's touch on product substitution, uh, because it, it obviously happens and uh, as it, when it happens. When the specification changes during construction, how will this work in relation to the golden thread? Um, I, th I think that's pretty straightforward, actually. Um, and I tried to cover that in my presentation. First of all, let's be realistic. Yes, substitution is going to continue to take place. Possibly less than it does now, uh, but it will continue to take place, and so it should, because you shouldn't be holding up the construction of the building simply because a particular product or material is not available. But in doing so, when you make that substitution, the process has to be one of assuring that what you are substituting is truly equivalent to what you had originally specified. If it is not, and if it is going to compromise the integrity of any of those layers in that protection system, mm. you shouldn't be doing it. And in any case, you're going to have to record the fact that you made that change. When you make a significant change, it has to be recorded as part of that golden thread process. So the regulator is then going to ask you why you made that change. And how did you satisfy yourself that it was the right thing to do and that the integrity of the building, as described in the design, is still preserved? Right. 
Now, you mentioned it a couple of times, but for the sake of anybody with a kind of ling lingering question about whether the uh, focus is on high-risk buildings, I think you said that pretty clear. I, got, I took it away pretty clear that it's about all buildings, not just high-risk. But do you, do you think the industry's really got to grips with that at the moment, that um, it's, it's about all buildings? Um, <clears throat> I think this notion of uh, a threshold at, at which a, a, an even tougher regime kicks in it does create this impression in people's mind that there's some kind of step up there. But the fact is that those principles apply to all buildings. The building safety regulator now is responsible for all building control. All building control. So everyone who, who is involved in building control is now overseen by the new regulator, irrespective of what they work in. The specifics about high-rise buildings are that safety case approach because it is the highest level of risk. Mm. Now, when we talk about um, cultural change, um, which, you know, anybody would, in the industry would acknowledge that that's a hard thing to do. What do you think the, the key things are to to start to get the ball rolling on that cultural change? I, th I think it's to recognize that you, that you have the capability to do it. Um, I said at the time that I published my report, and I've continued to say since then, that, that one of the privileges that I had during my time as chair of the health and safety executive was watching the construction industry pull itself up by the bootstraps and recognize that killing people on the job was not acceptable. And this is an industry that has changed its approach to workforce safety. It now has a much, much uh, stronger attitude. It's got out of that mindset of this is a dangerous industry and recognizes that you have to take care of your employees so you've done it once. The challenge now is to apply that same thinking and that same approach to taking care of the people who are going to live in those buildings that you create for the next 100 years because they matter just as much as those employees. Yeah, yeah. One of the questions that was submitted was um, re regarding design and build procurement. Mm -hmm. And uh, it said, do you see the principal designer being the architect who will have two bosses, the main contractor, and also through the principal designer role, the client? Um, <clears throat> again, I, I mentioned this in my presentation. For me, this is about a much more collaborative uh, and cooperative approach, much more about sharing of information. Uh, yes, particular individuals will be specific duty holders as part of this new process. It's not by accident that the titles that we have used in the Building Safety Act read across into CDM regulations. We did that and it was done by all of the policymakers deliberately to drive that level of consistency about who holds those roles. So we've tried to do it in such a way that those roles are ones that you're familiar with. But I do acknowledge that as part of the building process, you have now to be much more open and collaborative and share much more information to make that work effectively. Yeah. Okay. Just one more question before we open it up to the audience, which is, um, what is your message to the manufacturers in the audience about how, how they should position their products to the market? If I had to use one word, it would be be honest. Because we've all seen some shocking examples in the public inquiry of dishonesty, deceit, and bad practice. The onus is now on all of you to understand your products, know what they are usable for and what they are not, and to be ready, willing, and able to provide that advice to those who are going to specify and use those products with honesty and integrity. Yeah, very good, very good. Good, well, we've got a couple of minutes before we break, but are there any questions that we've got from the floor? Okay, please. Um, 
I'll use this. Ooh, very loud now. <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was amazing, so insightful. I think your last point, um, we are architects and we, we write specifications. And I think for us, one of the biggest challenges is getting hold of reliable test data on materials. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> without naming any names of products, but you know, a lot of manufacturers have now pulled out a lot of their test data and it's making it really, really difficult for us to actually yeah. know what we're specifying and, and yeah. the, the kind of granular detail of materials that we need to know. Do you have any guidance or um, I suppose any advice on how to tackle that whilst manufacturers are not releasing that information? Okay, <clears throat> I think the, the, what I can tell you is, is that weakness in the system is recognised, both in terms of um, the inadequacy of, of some of the test data, the secrecy of some of the tests that take place, and the, the way in which some of those tests are conducted, whether that's properly done or not. So I don't know how many of you have read any of the Morel Day report, uh, but it does lay bare what those um, challenges are in the system. And I was pretty clear in my presentation that, and indeed in my report, I said in my report, I wish I'd had the time to look at the product stuff as well as the regulatory regime. I'm really pleased that the Morel Day report has happened. Um, there is now a group working uh, on looking at how we might reform the product construction product testing and assurance regime. I've actually done some work on it myself um, on an international basis. So I was the chair of a group that looked at what a good regulatory system needs to look like. And we published a framework for that uh, at the beginning of this year. And that's now being used here in the UK as an overlay on our current system to say, if this is what good looks like, where are the gaps? So I would just say it's not going to get fixed overnight, but change is going to come. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? One at the back over there. Get your steps up today. Yeah, it's uh, Alan here. Um, I'm just thinking about you saying that probably April is when the new Health and Safety Act will come into full force. But my understanding of what I'm to uh, speak about is that probably 70% of the building work is actually covered by 30% of the big builders and construction companies. So you've got 70% just doing 30, and it's that 70%. How do we get this message across? Because they're the small builders but they've still got a role to play. And when we go on the various committees, etc., I did notice that a lot of big organisations are represented there, but not the smaller ones. So yeah. it's really what Dame Judith Hackett's thoughts are about that, getting the smaller builders involved and taking responsibility. I, th I think that's one of the areas that is probably going to take the longest, because it always does. That's a pattern that repeats itself time and again. Whether, with any new regulation um, or any change, uh, it, it's always hardest to reach those small and medium-sized enterprises and, and, and for them to make the changes because of their lack of, lack of resource. But in the end, what drives it is the supply chain itself because what you see a lot in this sector particularly is that tier one level then cascading down those requirements and those practices to others. So it won't be about the regulator talking directly to them necessarily, but about the supply chain that takes them on, setting new requirements of them and being very specific about what they need from them. Right, we've got time for one last question before we wrap up. Uh, 
Thank you, thank you so much. I'm Michelle Lee from Procore Technologies. I just picked up on a point when you mentioned um, that new builds require a digital approach moving forward. And I just wondered, how important do you think digital transformation of the sector is going to be when delivering on the New Building Safety Act? If you're not going to drown in a sea of paper, I would say it's essential. And, and what's more, I, th I think it, it, one of the things I find quite astounding is, is how far this sector is behind so many others. However, I think there is a note of caution in all of that because, um, as, as I'm sure you can imagine, I speak at a lot of conferences in a lot of different places, and one of the ones I spoke at earlier this year was the Digital Construction Week event, and I saw an awful lot of people offering off-the-shelf solutions. Uh, how good they all are, I have no idea. So I think there is a real need for intelligent customers here to pick the right products and not simply to jump at the first product they see because it does, just as with the buildings need to be fit for purpose, the digital system that you choose needs also to be fit for what you need it to do. Right. Well, listen, thank you very much, Dame Judith. It's been tremendous to hear about your ongoing oversight of the industry and uh, the, the clear need for change. And um, hopefully everybody can take something away from this and uh, enact some change. But uh, once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great.